Well, hello there and happy Friday. It's Friday the 12th of June 2020. Holy smokes. Where did May go? I'm not sure. But a lot of people are spending a lot of time on the internet. And a lot of people are coming up with some really fabulous questions that you want to know about biology. So that's kind of all I know for this week. I've been getting a lot of questions about courtship. <laughs> Everybody's been on the lockdown for a little while. We're all kind of interested in courtship and uh, displays of certain animals. Uh, a lot of questions came in this week that kind of speak to me of the greater theme of attraction. Uh, and in fact, I actually got a couple of questions from people that were asking, you know, what, what comes first, the attraction or the thing we are attracted to? And, uh, you know, it's like a chicken and egg kind of argument. And I love... I love that kind of thinking because biology isn't sort of one step, like a, a, a truncated step at a time. I mean, geology might be in some ways, and, you know, there's certainly ways we can truncate uh, things. But biology generally works on a, on a continuum. Uh, there's very rarely specific categories to anything. And so, yes, when we think about something that's the attractor, uh, that will be inevitably tied in with the thing that is attracted to it. And these things can and will co-evolve uh, much much like some kind of predator-prey relationships will co-evolve with each other. But an interesting wrench in the mix when we're talking about reproduction is that um, males and females are also often at war with each other, philosophically speaking, <laughs> and biologically speaking. I mean, I guess if you're if you have the brain power to get philosophical about it, you could be philosophically speaking. But sperm is generally the cheap and abundant gamete, right? And eggs are the expensive and rare gamete. And so this automatically pits males against females in terms of the kinds of sex, the strategies for sex, the kinds of attractions, so on. Um, and so how does this tie in to co-evolution? Well, there's often great big strategies that, that males in the animal kingdom do. And some of you are asking about feathers and birds and these bright, beautiful plumages that are huge signals to females. Yes, pick me, pick me. I am the guy of your dreams. And um, generally speaking, that takes a lot of biological energy for him to make. So is he going to be as good of a parent? Is he going to stick around? Probably not. But he does have good sperm and he's able to create this good house, which which is a signal of potentially the genes that he has inside of his body. Now that's a different thing than him actually surviving. And that is the difference between sexual selection and natural selection. So that same male who might be really bright and really flashy and getting all the ladies is also going to be big and bright and flashy to the eyes of a potential predator. And this is where an individual will make cost-benefit decisions uh, about their individual behaviors that will lead to them being reproductively successful or not. But I guess the main bottom line is that, yeah, you've identified through your questions this week, it's two very distinct lines of evolution. There's the natural selection, survival of the fittest, uh, and the offshoot of that, which is sexual selection. There are times when sexual ornaments take away energy from, uh, e from energy that could be spent in self-defense or in gathering resources in another way. So that's a really interesting example of... Um, well, what's on your minds this week? <laughs> what's always on my mind uh, when it comes to the animal kingdom and the ways that we can share how we're feeling and, and potentially how the rest of them, the rest of us all feel as well. Have a great weekend, guys. Talk to you next week.